Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Jude Blanchett. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for this important discussion as we uh, bring together experts to discuss the future of Hong Kong as a global business hub. Um, it is obvious to those who love uh, the city and have been uh, traveling to, working in Hong Kong, that it is a city under uh, an extreme amount of change and volatility over the past five to ten years, especially uh, over the past uh, three or four years since the outbreak of uh, COVID-19 and, of course, the passing of the national security law in 2020. Uh, both the data show that there has been an extreme amount of uh, flight of uh, residents from Hong Kong who are, who are moving out of the city. There's an extreme amount of volatility and uncertainty when you talk to the global business community about the future of their operations in Hong Kong. Do they feel uh, safe and secure operating in the city? How do they feel about the ability to hire and retain uh, talent? And of course, there's the important um, story about the civil, civic and legal freedoms of the residents of, of Hong Kong. All of these are incredibly important, not just for Hong Kong, not just for China, but for the world at large. Um, as we think about the future of the global order uh, in this century, looking at dynamics and changes in the Indo-Pacific, um, in the expansion or traction of democratic and economic freedoms is critical to all of us, especially the United States. We have an absolutely fantastic group of individuals who have come together today to help us think through these very important issues. We are delighted to, first of all, host a uh, keynote by the current Consul General of Hong Kong, Hanscom Smith, who has served in that position uh, since July 2019 and is rounding out his time, and an extraordinary time to be serving as the Consul General of this uh, absolutely amazing city. I'm also delighted to host a panel discussion after we hear from Consul General Smith. Um, we have Jessica Bartlett, who will be joining us shortly. She's the former chairwoman of the American Chamber of Congress in Hong Kong, or what I'll call AmCham. We have uh, the former president of AmCham, who is now a uh, senior director at Strategy Risks, Tara Joseph. And finally, but not least, we have Charles Mock, who's a former member of the Hong Kong Legislative Council, or LegCo, and he's now a visiting scholar at Stanford's Global Digital Policy Incubator. We, in the title of this event, had it as a question because we did not want to arrive at any predetermined answer. And I suspect today we're going to hear some nuanced views on this issue, where Hong Kong has hope and potential, but where we also need to be realistic about how much has changed in Hong Kong under the current leadership of the Communist Party, General Secretary Xi Jinping, um, and now the new uh, senior official who are serving in, in Hong Kong under Beijing's rule with John Lee, a former uh, police officer and security official. Um, so uh, I hope this is a productive conversation. We also, if you're watching this on the YouTube page, you can click a link and ask questions. I will be monitoring those and we'll raise those during the panel discussion. Um, so please do at any time. Uh, feel free to weigh in and ask your questions. But first, I'd like to turn the virtual floor over to uh, Consul General Hanscom Smith, a longtime um, uh, um, expert, uh, China hand, with deep, deep experience uh, throughout the, the Indo-Pacific, but especially in China, serving as the Consul General uh, previously in, in Shanghai, um, and also serving as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State responsible for China affairs. So we're really uh, thrilled to have him join us this morning, uh, fairly late, at least by my standards, uh, at, at uh, just after 9 o'clock, at least an hour past my bedtime. So. Uh, Council General Smith, thank you very much for joining us, and let me turn the, the virtual podium over to you. Thank you very much, Jude, and thank you for the invitation. It's good to be with everyone. Uh, this is a very important time in Hong Kong, as you said, and it's a valuable chance for us to take stock of the situation here 25 years after the establishment of the Special Administrative Region. The United States and Hong Kong have a relationship that goes back over 175 years, including extremely close economic and business ties. There are roughly 1,300 American companies here, over 100,000 Hong Kongers work for them, and we have about 70,000 Americans who live in the city. Our goods and services trade is in the tens of billions of dollars. 
American companies have made exceptional contributions to Hong Kong's business culture, advances in business and human resources, uh, promoting the importance of diversity and inclusion, corporate social responsibility, uh, and many other attributes. So U.S. business in Hong Kong plays an important role in representing American values. And our contribution to the business ethos in Hong Kong has been part of what's made the city so unique and successful. For decades, Hong Kong showed a strong commitment to building a society founded on transparency, accountability, the rule of law, and respect for individual freedoms. In recent years, however, as you noted, Jude, the political situation in Hong Kong has changed. And as a result, that has imperiled the city's bedrock of predictability. Today, I'd like to describe some of those changes and the effects on the city that I've seen during my three years here. I arrived in July of 2019 as the protests were beginning. Uh, July 1st, just a few days ago, was the 25th anniversary of the 1997 handover of Hong Kong from the United Kingdom to China. Back in 1997, in anticipation of that, Congress passed the Hong Kong Policy Act, which aimed to show U.S. support for Hong Kong's autonomy and to emphasize our desire to see the city's continued success under the one country, two systems framework, which was then completely new and an unproven concept. At first, one country, two systems seemed to work. Uh, sadly, however, in the past few years, the PRC government's actions have eroded that autonomy. So this year, for the third year in a row, the Hong Kong Policy Act report issued by the State Department concluded that Hong Kong does not have the high degree of autonomy that it once did. And as required by Congress, the Secretary of State certified that Hong Kong does not warrant under US law treatment in the same way as laws were applied to Hong Kong before July 1st of 1997. The report spotlighted many areas where direct actions by the mainland and Hong Kong governments eroded the city's autonomy. Uh, from dismantling of the city's uh, democratic institutions and the unprecedented pressures on the judiciary to the stifling of academic, cultural, and press freedoms and the coerced disbandment of dozens of civil society groups, the repercussions of those actions speak for themselves. Beijing has shaken the institutions and practices that have been the basis of the international confidence that Hong Kong long enjoyed. This includes the predictability that was fundamental to the city's rise as a global services and financial hub and its deep attractiveness for investors. This damage affects Hong Kongers themselves first and foremost. We understand from our conversations with US companies that it's also deeply affected international business interests as well, including of course the American firms and the American community that call Hong Kong home. In our view, the erosion of Hong Kong's autonomy also harms Beijing's long-term interests. The mainland can't have it both ways. Hong Kong's strength as a business hub will continue to erode if it stays on its current trajectory. Just 25 years into the 50 years of a high degree of autonomy promised by Beijing, business and rule of law risks that were formerly limited to the mainland are now increasingly a concern here in Hong Kong. It's in no one's interest, least of all China's, for Hong Kong to become just another mainland city. Hong Kong's uniqueness as the most international part of China has been at the heart of its success. And that success has depended on the high degree of autonomy that the PRC promised in the joint declaration with the UK. With deteriorating conditions here in Hong Kong, many of the city's best and brightest are seeking opportunities elsewhere. Over the past year, we very sadly said farewell to many from the international business community. Now, many are leaving because of both the mainland and Hong Kong government's approach uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has severely affected travel and access to public services. The predictability that businesses need is impossible under such conditions. But Hong Kongers themselves are also leaving. Many who have left, or who are planning to, have said they're leaving because they can no longer imagine a future for themselves and their families here. Increasingly, we're seeing indications that Hong Kong's highly educated young people are looking for opportunities elsewhere. If that becomes a larger trend, it would certainly hurt Hong Kong's long-term competitiveness 
as a place to do business. The innovators, creators, and builders who are leaving Hong Kong will contribute their talents to places with a fully functioning civil society, predictable rule of law, and respect for fundamental freedoms. So what has the United States done in response to this erosion of autonomy? We regularly engage at high levels with our mainland and Hong Kong government counterparts, and our key message is simple. Let Hong Kong be Hong Kong. In response to actions taken by the mainland and Hong Kong authorities, the United States and like-minded partners have publicly and privately raised concerns and called for those authorities to respect Hong Kong's promise of a high degree of autonomy. Multiple UN special rapporteurs have also called on Beijing to honor those promises. We've used our sanctions authorities to promote accountability for Hong Kong and mainland officials responsible for contributing to the PRC to meet its obligations under the Sino-British Joint Declaration and the Basic Law. We also want to ensure that the international business community has transparent information about the changes that the mainland has imposed on Hong Kong so that companies can make informed business decisions and assess risk properly. Last July, the State Department, along with the uh, Treasury Department, the Commerce Department, and the Department of Homeland Security, issued a business advisory regarding emerging risks to business operations and activities in Hong Kong, including those stemming from the draconian national security law, which was imposed two years ago, and other legislative changes. The bottom line is that the policies that the mainland government and the Hong Kong government have implemented undermine the legal and regulatory environment that has been essential for individuals and businesses to operate freely and with legal certainty in Hong Kong. Businesses should be aware that risks faced in mainland China are now increasingly present in Hong Kong. The national security law and actions taken by the mainland of Hong Kong authorities may negatively affect their staff, finances, legal compliance, data security, operations, and reputation. Uh, for example, businesses operating in Hong Kong, as well as individuals and businesses conducting business on their behalf, are subject to Hong Kong laws, including the national security law. Foreign nationals, including one American citizen, have been unjustly detained and arrested under that law. Businesses also face risks associated with electronic surveillance without warrants and the surrender of corporate and customer data to authorities. Businesses that rely on a free and open press to inform their decisions may face restricted access to information. And businesses operating in Hong Kong may face heightened risks and uncertainty if the PRC retaliates against companies that comply with sanctions imposed by the United States or other countries. So that's a grim accounting for a place that has long been one of the world's most open, stable, and transparent business locations. Ultimately, each country will conduct its own risk assess assessment, weigh the pros and cons, and determine the best course of action. Although we will continue to call attention to the rapid decline in fundamental freedoms in Hong Kong, please let me also stress, the United States wants Hong Kong to succeed. It's Beijing's decision to break the promises it made to Hong Kong and the world that have undermined the city's competitiveness and vitality. Hong Kong once thrived as an international hub because there was confidence in its openness, rule of law, and high degree of autonomy. For Hong Kong to flourish again, Beijing must honor its commitments to preserve the city's autonomy. So let Hong Kong be Hong Kong. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Council General Smith. I appreciate um, those remarks and um, I'd like to now, I know you've, you've, uh, you've got to go, so I want to just thank you for, for joining us um, and thank you for the time that you've spent um, as the senior representative for the U.S. government in Hong Kong during this, this remarkable time. Um, so the, the city will certainly miss you, but we'll, uh, we're happy to have you hopefully come a bit closer to, to the U.S., so thank you. Great. Thank you, Jude. Um, if I can now turn it over to uh, Tara and Charles, and again, we should have Jessica joining us uh, in a moment. I might first ask for um, your thoughts and reflections on uh, C.G. Smith's comments just now. Um, as he said, a, a grim accounting of what has occurred, but also, oh, I think, leaving open the door for 
possible improvements um, if, if Beijing uh, decides to make a, a course correction. So um, maybe, Charles, I might start with you. Um, in, in just hearing those remarks, does that, um, does that overlap with your own assessment? I, I very much echo what uh, Council General Smith talked about, especially about the uh, devolution of Hong Kong's and the erosion of our uh, 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 autonomy over the last 25 years. Uh, I would very easily, the first case, easiest case for me, closest to my heart is, I looked at the uh, colleagues that I worked with in the legislature over the last, uh, well, eight years, uh, not really last, but up until the 2020. Um, and uh, I would say that most, uh, well, actually more than half of those I work with uh, on the opposition camp, on the democratic camp, they are actually all in jail right now. And most of them are not uh, uh, even, they don't even know what they are going to be charged with under the national security law. But even if we're just looking at more closer to the business side of the issues, we look at uh, some of these values that uh, uh, Hanscom talked about, uh, rule of law, Independent, independent judiciary, uh, freedom of uh, information, expression, and uh, uh, press freedoms, and all that, uh, ease of doing business even. I think what we see right now is that, there's, that uh, it, it's very obvious to anyone in the business community, local or international, that all these values are being challenged and eroded. Uh, the, the, the one country, two system concept, if you listen to uh, President Xi Jinping in his remarks on July 1st, he would insist that it is still working. But to most of us, to all of us actually, uh, I think it has been transformed to something else. The definition has changed. But I think Beijing do realize that this is a problem. And if you look at, uh, well, uh, there was report of a meeting that was held by Beijing official in Hong Kong with the international uh, chambers of commerce, uh, and uh, they raised a number of questions in the meetings, but uh, most of them actually are still actually about uh, uh, how to do business in China, how to make it easier to do business in China. There was probably one out of five questions from the reports that I've read that was really about the uh, business environment of Hong Kong. So that tells you about the priorities of Beijing. Not to mention that the ultimate priority of national security law is about the uh, Beijing's legitimacy or its total control on, on, on political power. Uh, so I, I, my assessment is pretty grim. I would think that the good news is that, uh, if you want any good news, is that I think Beijing uh, do realize that, that this is an issue to them, but I think they want to solve it in their own way. And uh, the bad news is, uh, even if they are meeting with these international chamber of commerce, how much are they really listening? My worry is that uh, they have their own script all along, and they are trying to, uh, despite the fact that they say that they're listening, but I think the answers is already in, in the books written by the CCP. Thank you, Charles. Tara, can I ask uh, same same question to you, sort of over, overall thoughts, and does C.G. Smith's assessment O overlap with your own? It does, and uh, head-spinning changes over the last five years in Hong Kong. Just uh, listening to Hanscom list them down again as a reminder that Hong Kong went from one of the best and easiest places to do business in the world and to live, no matter what country you are from in the world, to now being uh, a much riskier place and a place that's much less connected, which is very, very difficult if you're there to do business. I found it very interesting how we mentioned that this harms Beijing's business interests. And this uh, intersects with some of the things that Charles was just saying that for Beijing, they're starting to recognize that they need to make sure that the golden goose of Hong Kong, uh, which is such an important part of money flows uh, for Beijing in and out and to the rest of the world, maintain some integrity. And that trust and um, comfort with that has really been broken up over the last few years. 
For me, the real question here is what's going to be more important? We've just seen Xi Jinping in Hong Kong putting his stamp of authority again on one country. And is politics going to dominate to the point where Beijing just allows um, those freedoms and the really important things to keep business and life ticking there to continue to disintegrate. So we're at a really interesting point over the next couple of years of whether it's going to disintegrate further and become a harder place to be or whether Beijing and Chinese authorities start to recognize that they need to rebuild connectivity and rebuild that focus of Hong Kong as an international business center. I'm not hugely optimistic, to be honest, but that door does need to be remained open. Tara, can I ask a, a follow-up, um, which is, it, it seems to me that the, um, the inflationary security state uh, ideology that, that clearly is driving a lot of policy in Beijing, not only how it's thinking about Hong Kong, but you're seeing this in the mainland as well, you know, under ideas such as the comprehensive national security outlook. Um, so it seems like the, the operative ideology in Beijing is, is, to me, less Marxism and more national security. Um, you just mentioned, you know, the possibility that there's some kind of equilibrium that is found uh, or that Beijing tri tries to strike in Hong Kong of enough to where they feel like they've got the city, you know, quote unquote, under control, but they haven't killed the, the goose that laid the golden egg. I, I'm just, it strikes me as that's going to be a very hard uh, balance for Beijing to strike. W what do you assess on that? I do think it's a really hard balance to strike, and um, which is why my note of optimism is definitely subdued. Um, but if you look at Hong Kong right now and you look at the financial infrastructure, um, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, which is the de facto central bank, uh, is still well respected. Um, it's, it's run uh, with international uh, attention and some general sense that it's really well operated and run. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange uh, has an excellent reputation. It is um, a very developed financial infrastructure. And even though we're not seeing people move across borders, there are definitely still capital flows moving in and out of Hong Kong. Um, and that remains a very important function for businesses, along with the fact that the tax uh, system in Hong Kong is very, very beneficial to business. So what are the problems? The problems are, will that be overridden? Um, will the human connectivity and the human sense of what's happening in Hong Kong when it comes to rule of law and freedoms of media actually really start to impinge on that comfort with what is a pretty good financial infrastructure? We haven't seen it really fall apart yet to this point, despite everything that's happened in Hong Kong. And yet you've got to ask the question, if you can't speak freely, uh, if the rule of law is starting to erode, how long can that golden goose remain untouched? I think it's an amazing experiment to watch for anybody who tries to understand how great financial systems evolve, but also there's a huge amount of risk now. Um, Charles, I had a follow-up question for you and also wanted to say hi to Jessica. I'm, I'm really glad you can, you can join us. We were just um, discussing some of key takeaways from uh, Hanscom's you know, in, introductory remarks. Charles, one of the things that Hanscom mentioned is, and, and I hear this a lot as well, this idea that Hong Kong is now just another mainland city. Um, it seems to be this, Hong Kong is in this, um, this difficult to describe transition phase where it clearly is not just another mainland city, but yet it is clearly not Hong Kong of, as Tara was just mentioning, three years ago. Um, I, I wanted to ask, when you hear, you know, now that you're in the United States, when you hear um, people, businesses say, they think of uh, Hong Kong as just another mainland city, um, what does that get right and what does that get wrong? I actually, uh... Thought, have thought about this uh, for a long time myself because when we look at when I even when I used to be in Hong Kong, I look at Hong Kong as uh, a very different city from uh, other cities in China, in particular because of uh, the basic law and the the one country two system. But most importantly, 
uh, I think Hong Kong thrived and uh, was successful was successful because it was different from China, not because of total assimilation. But I think, unfortunately, with the imposition of the national security law, and also very important to remember, is the total overhaul of the political system. Uh, in the past, we had a, uh, a relatively vibrant, even though not totally democratic, legislature. But still, we had uh, sufficient, or not, I shouldn't say sufficient, but we have considerable uh, 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 voices in the legislature to to, to, to talk about what the people really want, what the people really think about. But today, they are all handpicked by Beijing. And so, uh, or even the, the judiciary, I'm very worried about that because uh, rather than having a completely uh, and, and, and very well uh, run uh, and independent judicial, judicial system, Right now, Xi Jinping in Hong Kong, he just basically made it very clear that the cooperation of the three branches, including the judiciary with the administration, is of critical importance to the to in Beijing's mind. So you can you can imagine if you are a judge and you expect it to be appointed uh, and and uh, and rise up in the rank in Hong Kong's uh, court system, what would you do if you are trying to make a ruling on a case? So that's really really changed and i i i think the the uh when i think about hong kong as an international city uh the biggest problem right now is that uh the after the imposition of the national security law and all these changes in the political system uh and also the creation of a huge bureaucracy that really depends on enforcing national security. There are thousands of people right now in the national security police apparatus. Now, my worry is that they, along with all these people who are handpicked by Beijing to serve in the legislature and in different parts of the government, they'll continue to have to find things to do. And, uh, and uh, they, that's my worry is that they will continue to pick on uh, civil society, education, increasingly even the business sector in order to accomplish what they think is the goal of China, of Beijing. And sometimes I don't even know whether that is really the goals of Beijing. But my worry is that if you look at just the appointment of John Lee, uh, he doesn't know too much about the how the financial system works in Hong Kong and various different industries and commercial sectors and so on. He's a policeman. So that's my worry. Jessica, Jessica, if I can bring you in, I, I wanted to ask about the role of um, uncertainty for companies operating in Hong Kong that's brought about by um, sanctions that are that are coming in um, from from the U.S. But also, you know, one of the one of the notable features, of course, is companies having to navigate the terrain of the national security law, and as Charles was just mentioning. It's difficult terrain to navigate because it's not a thick, well-established uh, bureaucracy with lots of precedents that companies can use as, as benchmarks. Um, also, you've got Beijing honing its um, financial you know, warfare toolkit with things like the anti-foreign sanctions law, which of course was not extended to Hong Kong, interestingly, but sort of hangs there, um, hovering you know, 10,000 feet above. Um, so I wanted to ask if you can just give us your assessment on what you're hearing uh, from companies and investors about how um, that thicket of sanctions and, and potential punitive action, uh, tools that, that both Beijing and the United States have are impacting sentiment. Yeah, Jude, happy to take that on and, and great to join. And I appreciate everybody being accommodating of my schedule. And Charles and Tara, it's great to see you on screen uh, and reconnect. It's really wonderful. And it's great to talk about Hong Kong. Um, for those who don't know, I cover sanctions. So for the past three, three four months, all I've been doing is talking about Russia. So <laughs> this, is a, this is a delight in a way. Um, but I, I think the way that a lot of companies look at this is holistically. Right. So you've got the sanctions piece for certain sectors. The export controls are, uh, you know, really important for them to ensure they understand and comply with and have impacted their business. But that's not necessarily every sector. And they have to look at the national security law and how that impacts 
uh, their business um, and also just the general political environment. Um, so if you go back to when I first moved to Hong Kong, it was a very open, very vibrant society, one in which people could just from America could just come in and hit the ground running and kind of do their, you know, do their business, right? Um, and do their jobs and, and, you know, create a lot of wealth for themselves and, and for others. And now they walk into a more uh, challenging environment. Um, so how do businesses respond to that? Um, they contingency plan a lot more. They invest a lot more in their legal and compliance functions than they had to historically in certain areas. Um, and they may look at um, diversifying across the region. So yes, the business still wants to have a hub in Hong Kong. The fundamentals for many businesses remain very strong. Um, while COVID has limited travel, I think they all think at some point the border will be open and Hong Kong is much closer than other cities um, in Asia. You have free movement of currency that you do not have in the mainland. Those, those fundamentals remain, but it is not the same kind of easy environment that it used to be. So do you want to have all of your executives in Hong Kong? Do you spread them across other areas in the region? Which functions do you need in Hong Kong? Which might be better placed in Singapore? Um, some perhaps just going all in on the mainland uh, or moving otherwise around the region. I mean, Hong Kong is an expensive city, so you've got to add that into the mix as well. So I, I think most companies have come to the view that um, this, is, this is kind of the new status quo, right? This kind of level of uncertainty uh, and the political system, which is answering much more up north than it is necessarily to local business concerns, is kind of the new way that you're going to have to navigate. Now, for many businesses, they have a huge footprint in Beijing. Some of them have been dealing with this type of environment for quite a while. Uh, so they're you know, not necessarily happy, but they can figure out the ways and use the tools and methods that they do in the mainland and bring them into Hong Kong and continue to function. For other businesses, that may not may not work for them based on what sector they're in. Um, I have certainly heard of people who have had to close up shop and and leave um, in the in this environment, um, in the tech sector and media, et cetera. So it is more challenging. There is uncertainty. Uh, I think we will continue to see a pretty vibrant business environment because they see the benefits of Hong Kong over other cities in the region, but they're assessing all of that against a very different environment than five years ago. Just as a, as a follow-up, it sounds like some, and I've heard this anecdotally from some uh, companies, that actually the, the best heuristic for them is to think about Hong Kong as if it's another mainland city. Um, is, is, that a, is that a strategy? In a way, and I would agree with Charles, like it's, it's half, half right, half maybe not quite so right. Um, I mean, if you're talking about how you need to manage some things politically and manage political risk, that's probably a pretty decent heuristic to use and a, and a mind frame, mindset to use. Um, if you're otherwise talking about capital flows or things like that, no, it's very different and it remains very different. Um, and I think the businesses have a key interest in that remaining very different. And if you're talking about regulation by, you know, in the financial services where I sit, regulation by the HKMA or the SFC or dealing with the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, you are still talking about a very different environment um, than if you go onto the mainland. They simply do not work the same. And I think most, you know, financial services companies uh, far prefer and understand the Hong Kong system and are not necessarily ready to go all in into the mainland. Those are very key strategic decisions. They want access to the mainland, but it's a very different decision to base yourself in Hong Kong versus base yourself in, in the mainland. So in those respects, the city is quite different. But if you're talking about political engagement, political risk, um, whether, you know, and how you engage with the government, what your constituents are when you're engaging, if you have your, your government relations folks, who they need to really be talking to. Um, is it local government on an issue? Is it, you know, Beijing? Those are very different assessments and probably much more like how people operate in the mainland than they have in Hong Kong historically. Jude, if I can just follow up on, on something that Jessica is saying, um, I think one of the big question marks for Hong Kong, uh, as she says, that infrastructure is still there. 
But in, if you're based in China, so to differentiate China, mainland China from Hong Kong, you know what lane you need to be in in China in mainland. Uh, it's been very obvious for a while. The thing that brings risk to Hong Kong is you're moving into a new lane, a new normal, and you're just not sure what could be coming next, whether things are going to continue to change, whether risk is going to get higher, whether COVID rules are going to change week to week. So it's not quite the same as mainland China from an executive standpoint, just in terms of being able to measure that risk yet. It's a new environment and everyone's still trying to suss it out. And so is Beijing, presumably. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's been such an um, interesting feature of the discussion on Hong Kong, at least from companies, investors I've talked to, is Hong Kong has gone in a, in, tragically and in a very short amount of time from being the most predictable city in greater China to the least predictable, even vis-a-vis -vis cities in the mainland, where I think because a lot of companies have been operating in the mainland for decades, and as I was mentioning earlier, you, you've, you've got a lot of data points to orient yourself around. You, you have a sense of where the risk boundaries are. And it seems like, to build on Charles's point, you have these new national security bureaucracies which are trying to you know, f feel out their role under the, the gaze of Beijing, where I think, you know, Charles, to your point with John Lee, um, you know, he's going to have to be a political entrepreneur to, to feel this roll out. And I think that's just contributing to uh, this, this deep uncertainty. Um, Tara, can I actually want to come back to just um, adjacent to the national security law. There are other concerns that the business sector has uh, about um, Hong Kong. Charles had just mentioned the, the general breakdown of political uh, freedoms, concerns about judicial independence, one that um, you have focused a, a lot on is COVID restrictions. Um, and I, I wanted to ask if you can just give us a, a, an on-the-ground assessment of how Hong Kong's COVID policies have affected um, business sentiment and what you project for where Hong Kong goes, uh, goes from here. They have, you know, they've just clarified in the last few days that they're not going to move back towards a general lockdown amidst this most recent spike. But what, what is your assessment? The COVID restrictions have had a huge impact in various ways. First of all, it has been the icing on the cake in terms of lifting that risk profile. So first there was the national security law. There's also been protests. There's been a, a huge uh, change in the image of Hong Kong globally. That affected things. But then take away travel and connectivity for people who are not based in Hong Kong permanently, and it becomes an even more difficult scenario. Add to that uh, that the COVID restrictions not only were draconian, but remained in place for a very long time without any real sense or KPIs of what the government was looking for, when they would be lifted, how it was going to work. Uh, the international business community tried over and over again to ask for some type of indication of how things were going to work. And it just kind of went from higher restrictions to medium restrictions back and forth and really started to affect people's livelihood and comfort factor in Hong Kong. We've seen a lot of people, including myself, who left Hong Kong eventually because there was just no sense of how it was going to change. The rest of the world was and has moved on, and Hong Kong was still stuck in a rut. So that has left a real sense of insecurity about returning to Hong Kong, a real sense of not only are we operating in a new normal politically, but this is how it leads and impacts into people's personal lives. So the story isn't over, even if uh, restrictions are lifted further in Hong Kong, because there will be that seed of doubt in people's minds of, well, could it come back again any time? Could it change again any time? And that's very difficult for business. It's impossible for families who are trying to operate and go around the world and do things. And you see the rest of the world moving in a very different way, including Singapore and other Asian hubs. Do you expect that um, Hong Kong really only achieves some sort of predictability or normalcy once mainland China does on COVID? And what's the what's your calendar on that? Is this a 
post 20th Party Congress early spring, or or is this? I mean, it's hard to it's hard to look into the future here, but. Yeah, uh, conventional wisdom had it uh, earlier this year and late last year that we would have to wait for the Congress party event to be over before we could see any sort of permanent changes around COVID. And that's because Xi Jinping has really put a political stake down uh, of how he has handled COVID and, and COVID zero policy. So to see real changes, it's unlikely that anything will happen before then. We'll see some sort of changes up and down and loosening of restrictions. But uh, the mainland has not brought in international vaccinations. It's still sticking to its zero COVID policy. It has a different cultural view of, of how disease and how things should be handled. So the jury is still out for a while to come. Charles, you want to come in on this? Yeah. I. I, I... I think Hong Kong's zero COVID strategy is really more about China than about the rest of the world. I remember maybe it was yesterday when John Lee went to the legislature for his first Q&A and there was one question about the uh, COVID policy. And I think uh, in, uh, it was recorded that in his answers, he mentioned China or Shenzhen more than 10 times and the rest of the world, he mentioned it probably once or twice. So it's very, very clear that the officials in Hong Kong, the priority of their COVID strategy uh, uh, policies is really about opening up to China, not to the rest of the world. So they have to align with what China is doing. Now, for China itself, I, I, I think it's, it's uh, pretty obvious to me that zero COVID uh, uh, or the COVID policy in general is a political decision rather than scientific or medical uh, consideration uh, decision. And uh, my worry is that the zero, zero COVID strategy is too good a political control tool for China to give up. Uh, no matter uh, whatever happens, and I don't think there's any too much surprise that we can expect uh, in the uh, party congress later in the year. I don't actually think by now that that is a very much a, a high consideration for the uh, CCP or for Xi Jinping. It's really about whether or not they are comfortable giving up such a great political control tool that they have in their hands and uh, people are sort of used to them. And sh Shanghai, remember, I think what happened in Shanghai the last couple of months was really a stress test for the party to see how far they can go. So I think they passed, they, or at least in their minds that they have passed. Charles, I wanted to ask you about how, um, I mean, you, you yourself are an example of uh, someone who has left the city and now you're, you're, you're based out in, in Stanford. And you've also been, both in your current position, but previously thinking a lot about technology in the technology sector. I, I wanted to ask, we've been talking a lot about sort of financial services, yeah. U.S. companies. I wanted to ask about Hong Kong's indigenous technology sector and what are what is the current state right now, uh, both because of COVID policy, uh, but importantly because of events of the past few years, including the national security law? Well, I think in general, the biggest problem for the technology sector is really about the losing the loss of the talents, uh, people that are moving away, uh, local talents, young people. Uh, by the time that I believe if the UK come out with its next statistics about how many people move to the UK under the BNO visa plan, uh, the number might very well exceed 200,000. And uh, these are total figures, not all of them are professionals, you know, there are many families in there, but I think the, 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 from the statistics and the feeling we get, get from people that we know who have moved, most of these people, the majority would be younger people or people in the mid-career with young families uh, they worried about the future of education for the children and so on. So that's a big factor that they decided to possibly give up on a very good job and move, uh, both in the technology as well as financial and the other sectors. So the loss of talent, I think, is the biggest thing. But I think for many relatively small companies or even entrepreneurial uh, startup types of companies in Hong Kong, uh, I met a few friends, old friends, when I was in the UK last couple of weeks. and. Uh, I, I got the feeling that many of these companies were not closed in Hong Kong. Officially, they haven't moved. They're still in Hong Kong. 
but uh, the, the owner or the entrepreneur itself or uh, many of his staff are actually moved out of Hong Kong. They're still operating. Some of them are saying that they're still getting calls from their Hong Kong customers uh, and they're trying to you know, uh, turn them away or, or whatever. But in some cases, they're still keep taking in new customers from Hong Kong, even though the company hasn't moved, but the people have all moved away. So I, I think there's going to be increasingly hollowing out the effect of the technology sector. But if you think about the multinational, they're still going to be there uh, for many reasons. You know, there's still profits to be made. There's still good business with many of the global businesses. They're still in Hong Kong. So I think for the global companies, they're still there. But particularly if you look at the internet sector and the telecommunication sectors, I think there's a couple of areas of deep concern. First is the uh, uh, US sanctions of the telecommunications uh, infrastructure that are going out to Hong Kong from the US. And basically, I think in the foreseeable future, we're not going to see any new undersea cable going out to Hong Kong uh, from the US. So that is a huge factor for the future development of Hong Kong's uh, data center and telecommunications and internet uh, business, uh, 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 because the, the growth in the capacity to probably the most important uh, part of the market, global market, the, the US, uh, is, uh, is gone. So, uh, and the other worry is the uh, upcome, a number of upcoming laws, particularly targeting the tech sector, including the cybersecurity law, cybercrime laws, uh, Article 23 laws that I think will be mainly focused on foreign connections uh, that I think will probably work as a substitution for the anti-sanction laws that they sort of put a hold on uh, previously. Uh, so they could probably put in some process in there to do something similar to the anti-sanction uh, laws that, that without having to for it a handy sanction law, but simply using the local enactment of national security law to get by to do it, and so on. So there are a misinformation law as well. So I think if you are in the technology and particularly in the information sector for Hong Kong, there are a lot of obstacles. You know, I talked to some of those multinational companies, many of them, especially American companies, and I think they're worried. They're still keeping the best of hopes that, the, that they will be able to uh, give their views to the government during the consultation process. But uh, I don't think it will be a consultation process like before uh, in Hong Kong, you know, before the, net, the, 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 the national security law, uh, before the, all these changes took place. Uh, I just worry that uh, the consultation will be rather superficial and short, maybe, you know, a month or two, or, or two weeks and so on. Uh, rather than very lengthy and multi-staged uh, uh, consultation that the government used to do in the last two decades. I wanted to pull on uh, two threads that Charles just mentioned. Um, Tara, I'm going to go to you first, and then, and then Jessica, I wanted to ask you uh, in a minute about the anti-foreign sanctions law and, and future prospects for it. But Tara, just first, I, um, can you talk about what the talent pool will look like for U.S. multinationals in Hong Kong? It seems like we've, we've got a brain drain, uh, secular trend that is likely to continue of untold magnitude, um, as, as Charles was just mentioning. So indigenous talent um, is looking um, for, for other places to locate. At the same time, I would imagine it's getting harder to bring in expatriate staff uh, to convince them to um, to move to Hong Kong as opposed to taking a position in Singapore, or Tokyo. So, can you give us a state of what the talent pool looks like now, and and a prognostication of how difficult this terrain will be for companies looking to retain or hire? Yeah, like uh, everything else in Hong Kong, there's a big shift taking place. And yes, the brain drain is huge and real. And that's going to be very difficult going forward for what makes Hong Kong a center for excellence. A very, very highly educated local population that's in management uh, across sectors in Hong Kong and also expatriate talent from around the world. So you have a big problem there. Um, but what companies are looking at now is shifting towards a more 
um, Mandarin speaking executive level. Uh, and the feeling is that even though many people may be leaving Hong Kong, Hong Kongers included, that there will be folks from mainland China coming in to fill those roles. Hong Kong is a very important city, but it's also quite small when you come to the number of people who actually live and work there. Uh, mainland China is huge. There's a huge group of talent there. And there's also a large pool of talent uh, from mainland China that went to universities in the United States, in Canada, and the UK. And Hong Kong becomes a very ripe place to have those people be based, uh, especially since increasingly business is conducted in Mandarin, dealing with mainland Chinese firms, et cetera. The view is that really eventually there'll be a much greater quote unquote mainlandization of the executive and management sectors. That's gonna be a really difficult transition. It's already proving to be if you're in a company uh, and on, on the floor of those who still actually go into the offices uh, in companies post COVID, you will see that there are groups of, of mainland Chinese executives, very talented, but a different culture from Hong Kong people. Uh, and then again, a different culture from um, expats from around the world. So rebuilding um, how those groups are gonna work together and also the change in ratio is something that we'll all need to watch closely over the next few years. And it's also going to change the trust factor uh, for multinationals. If your executives are coming from a different part of the world, how is that gonna work reporting back into headquarters in the United States? A, a whole new ball game is being set up, basically. Um, taking the baseball analogy uh, to you, Jessica, in terms of a whole new ball game, we've got um, over the past several years a lot of activity coming from the U.S. on the export control, the sanctions front. Um, um, uh, Hanscom laid out in detail these during his uh, during his remarks. Charles was just talking about some of the. Uh, legal shifts that are occurring in in Hong Kong itself, and then of course you've got this mainland piece where you have this raft of legislation with 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 significant implications, potential or or, or actual on the data security front, but also one in particular is the uh, anti foreign sanctions law. Um, so I, I wanted to ask if you could talk about how this these massive moving pieces um, are, are shaping. Uh, the business environment, and then in, in particular, any thoughts or prognostications on the anti-foreign sanctions law, the, 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 the fact that they withheld extending that to Hong Kong seems to indicate, to a point Taro was making earlier, there is awareness of um, you want control, but you don't want to kill the goose that laid uh, the golden egg for now. My sense is a lot of folks watching this expect just at some point this will this will come down, uh, move down south. Um, so uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the, the 35,000 foot picture um, and then the 2,000 foot picture on, on just the, the anti-sanctions law. Uh, it's a complex environment uh, when it when it comes to how companies na navigate sanctions and export controls. I think it's, it's interesting to come back to the U.S. and basically I hear the view over here that people view it as a direct conflict that you can't comply with with U.S. sanctions in Hong Kong and China uh, because of the the anti foreign sanctions law and what may likely be coming in the anti foreign sanctions law coming for Hong Kong. Um, but when you talk to companies operating in Hong Kong, they, they haven't taken a position that they're not gonna comply with, with US sanctions. Um, that's not palatable, that needs to happen. Um, I don't think most of the big multinational banks, including the Chinese multinational banks, are going to endanger their access to the dollar, right? Uh, and certainly the HKMA is in no position to do that. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the PEG, um, but you know, as been at least for the time being, has been made very clear that that's not going anywhere. So access to the dollar will be extremely important. So then it's a matter of how do you navigate through what might be a fairly complex environment. And there's uncertainty there because the mainland has not used the anti-sanctions law, right? It, it, it's a framework that sits above. They haven't actually issued any orders as yet. Um, so we're not quite certain how they're going to use that and will they actually block um, a, a sanction that may come in other than you know putting 
there's kind of certain things on the margin, certain companies, certain people they put on put on lists, um, but not a overall blocking order. Um, when the anti-foreign sanctions law was being proposed for Hong Kong, there was a huge amount of uh, local concern across sectors, public and private. Uh, and I think that had a lot to do with why it was ultimately pulled, um, because they didn't see, uh, this, and I think financial services was perhaps the most vocal, but by, certain, by no means the only sector potentially impacted. Um, but they didn't see how you could really marry together the two without a whole lot of kind of underlying guidance and regulations that, that were simply not there. That's not how that law is is written, right? Um, but to, to Crystal Ballgays, is it is it coming? I mean, I think we see the developments on the mainland. We've seen, you know, references made to Article 23 as being important for Hong Kong to do. Will the anti-foreign sanctions law be a piece of that to be local legislation or some marrying between a mainland law put into the basic law with local legislation supporting it? Um, yeah, I think many think that that's probably the way that will go. What the timing is, nobody knows. We'll have to watch that very closely. Businesses are. And I think many businesses are pressing the government for consultation on these issues. I think they appreciate that when it comes to national security, Hong Kong may have very little say in a particular law coming in. It's going to come in. The question is, what is that going to look like? How is that going to be tailored for Hong Kong? And the concern, as Charles already mentioned, that some of these are very complex issues and that Hong Kong is a very different city than other cities in the mainland. And if we don't have sufficient consultation, um, there could be real disastrous unintended consequences that could impact institutions and businesses in Hong Kong in very negative ways that, that don't really need to happen and could be avoided. But will that opportunity be given? And I think that is the big question mark at the moment. Um, Jessica, my sense would be that the the usage and timing of the usage of the anti-foreign sanctions law or other tools that Beijing has created like the unreliable entities list would be tied to developments in the US-China relationship. Would that be the right uh, framing if we were trying to generalize and, and, and look ahead? I, I think largely, although I think the environment has become, to use a great word, unprecedented and complex um, this year, given what's um, happening around Russia, right? Um, you are seeing a very different environment in terms of how the US, UK, EU are formulating their sanctions policy and whether you're going to see um, how the different countries are going to align. So I, I, I often frame it, we're in a very different world than we were seven years ago when I moved to Hong Kong. And it was very clear kind of the US was king, the dollar was king, um, and people would generally fall in line, including, you know, lots of third countries, right? If you look at how countries played ball on US Iranian policy, even if they didn't like it, um, versus now, you're not see you see a very strong alignment among the G7. Right. You don't see that same strong alignment when you go down to South America, when you come out to Asia, when you go to Africa, you don't. And, and much of that's very understandable. Energy and food security are very, very high concerns. But there's also, I think, not the political buy in that there used to be about kind of this U.S. led world order. Um, so how that's going to play out with U.S. China policy and if the U.S. is quite aggressive, how China will respond. Um, may play out against a very different geopolitical environment than seven years ago. Final question. If I can oh, please, please, just follow up on, on what Jessica said, putting it uh, into a U.S. reaction and bringing it back to Hong Kong uh, in the new world order or the changing world order that we're in. Um, Hanscom Smith went through a list of the, the actions that the U.S. took um, with the encroachment of mainland China on Hong Kong sanctions, export controls, a business advisory. Uh, I'm somewhat disappointed that the U.S. has not taken a stronger role on Hong Kong and a stronger uh, action on Hong Kong when it comes to issues like human rights, like Congress eventually took on Xinjiang or uh, on dealing with how Hong Kong is changing and, and actually 
building safe harbor for Hong Kong people, many of whom share American values to come to the United States as doors have been opened in the UK and other places. There are other things that the US can do beyond sanctions, beyond uh, that type of policy, which I think should send a very strong signal um, to a place like Hong Kong and other parts of Asia that the US cares about this type of encroachment. It cares about the population and it cares about human rights. I don't see why that has to be separated out when it comes to Hong Kong just because it's a business hub. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, we've got about uh, 10 or so minutes left. I wanted to turn to some of the questions which are coming in, um, if I may. Um, first question, maybe Charles, I'll, I'll steer this to you and I'm gonna um, uh, make you an honorary lawyer um, for the sake of answering this question, which is um, uh, future of judicial independence in Hong Kong, um, especially now with the new chief executive who, who comes with a strong security background. Um, and we'd love to hear others weigh in on this as well, especially, I think, in, in regards to how Hong Kong courts might be ruling on commercial litigation. Uh, you know, there have been concerns that you may see a, 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 a pro-PRC bias, you know, merge in the courts, or if you've got ICBC in some sort of dispute with a, you know, U.S. or, or, or a Hong Kong company, one, it's not too great of a leap of imagination to, ima to, to think that ICBC may win that. Um, but uh, Charles, at just a, a broad level, uh, prognostications, thoughts on, on, on Hong Kong's judicial autonomy? Broad level, I, I think you're right. Uh, uh, there are a lot of concerns, but we haven't seen such a test case yet, maybe for the commercial or financial industry sector. Uh, if you look at what most of these political uh, related cases uh, to national security, uh, I think you already see the trend that the court uh, ruling uh, very much in favor of uh, the, 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 the overall concept and, and, and importance of uh, national security. Uh, you look at many of the sentencings and the decision of the court, uh, they don't need a lot of precedence, uh, unlike previous cases uh, or previous decisions in the court. But surely for the commercial sector, for businesses, we haven't seen those cases yet. But uh, when it happens, if it happens, and certainly, I think the government has said many times, Beijing or Hong Kong, that national security is not just about protest, it's not just about political unrest, it's also about financial security uh, and, uh, and, and business and data and all these issues that are very closely tied to business interests. So I think the worry is there. Uh, and I don't believe that the business sector can believe, continue to or, to, or, or believe that it is immune from these threats. But uh, fortunately, or not, we haven't seen those cases yet, I think. Tara, Jessica, Dude, any, I'd any, be, any thoughts I'd be on happy that? to come in on that too, yeah. Um, this was, I am a lawyer, a common law lawyer, <laughs> was never a Hong Kong solicitor, um, although I did very strongly consider becoming one. Um, so I am a, a US uh, trained lawyer. Um, and I think Charles, you're right, right? We have not seen as a, a, a change in kind of how commercial litigation is run. Businesses are looking at it, right? That's part of that contingency planning, um, taking a fresh look at whether, you know, where their choice of law clauses are. Uh, I think at a, a higher, level and a longer term uh, lens to take on this. And, and I, I borrow from one of our other former chairman, Jack Lang, and thinking about this. Um, you know, a common law system is an adversarial system, right? It is a system of a plaintiff and a defendant. Now, I'm a defense lawyer, right? It is a place of a prosecutor and a defense. And if you do not have a vibrant or any opposition, right? You don't have the ability to oppose politically. Do you have the ability to oppose in the court? Are all defenses available to you? And I think what we've seen, which is concerning, is that may not be the case in national security law cases. There may be lawyers taking particular risks if they are defending certain people. And if they cannot do that in one area, will they do it in others? Will they take those types of personal risks? You know, these are people with families. Um, and that is a longer term concern that you will not have a fully functioning common law system if you don't have a vibrant um, kind of defense 
uh, uh, sector, in, in the legal sector, a strong bench of lawyers who are prepared to oppose the government in court or oppose policy in court. Um, that's not something you're necessarily going to see immediately, but you will see over time and could lead to a deterioration. Um, Tara, just a uh, slight modification of the question, which is how were member companies um, articulating concerns or not about uh, judicial independence moving forward? Um, well, I, I think a lot of what Jessica says makes a lot of sense. There's this sense of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Um, at MCHAM, just before I, we left, uh, we did a survey. And while people could not put a finger on how the judicial system was changing, there was a sense that in three years' time, it would be eroding, and there was a lot less optimism about it going forward. And it is this sense of, will there be a vibrant defense? What case will it be where it would be very difficult to stand in opposition because there is no real sense of, of an acceptable opposition in Hong Kong anymore now with the national security law and, and, and the new government uh, in Hong Kong being obviously closer and cl more closely constrained by mainland China. Um, the sense of opposition is just declining. There's self-censorship across the board, and that would spread the courts, as Jessica mentioned. Um, Jessica, I've got a question that um, comes in that I'm going to put to you first, which is um, the context around this is we've, we've had these unprecedented surprising sanctions uh, uh, levied against Russia, um, which I think surprised even those who were issuing the sanctions and just how quickly that conversation was moving. Um, obviously, the, the connection a lot of our drawing are now is thinking about Taiwan. Um, and there's this trying to get ahead of the curve of what risk appetite is there now to be levying sanctions against, uh, against China. Um, the, the question is um, scenarios and circumstances where the US would consider more drastic options vis-a-vis -vis China, um, cutting China off from SWIFT, um, cutting China off from access to the USD. Um, do you see any reasonable, plausible scenario under which the United States goes to that level of aggressiveness? And, and I use the word um, likely and reasonable rather than in theory, because I'm sure in theory we could come up with some cases, but. Right, because in theory, any time you see uh, a sanctions authority use certain tools. Those are the tools that are in, the, in their box, right? And they've developed some new tools in their box with Russia. The, the next question is, would they actually use them again? And if they do, targeting who? And would that be targeting China? Um, that's very hard to predict. Uh, and what I would point to is that uh, Russia and China are very different economies. Yes, they are very large economies. Um, and the US has never taken such aggressive moves against such a large economy as Russia. And that is having some very serious economic impacts, um, particularly in emerging markets, as I mentioned earlier. The questions around energy and food security are real and in some markets dire, right? Um, and we're coming up on winter very quickly. And there are big concerns about um, how people are going to get access to energy and heat and food. So that we can see how some of those aggressive tools, it's not the only reason, it's not just the US and G7 sanctions that have led to this scenario. Just to be clear, we've got lots of activity on Russia and blockades, et cetera. Um, but certainly they played a part and they uh, make the environment very complex and they have economic impacts. So if you take that to China, which is a very different economy. In some ways, we, US and Chinese economies far more integrated than they are with Russia. Will, how will those same tools play out? These are political tools. They are tools of foreign policy. They do not need to be used in the same way. And part of what the US does when it thinks about, am I gonna deploy a certain sanction against a country is what are what is the economic impacts to the United States, to consumers, to other populations in the world, to our allies. So it's a very complex calculus they have with consultation among you know, state, OFAC, the White House, Treasury. So 
how they will come to a view if they think that they need to ratchet up sanctions policy and engage in more economic kind of warfare, to use that term, based on a deterioration of the U.S.-China relationship or certain actions they feel they must respond to uh, that China may take vis-a-vis Taiwan. Uh, again, I think we they're preparing more for a scenario of different policies vis-a-vis Taiwan, a slower march as opposed to extreme policy change. That will be played out against the world economy, against all of the other considerations of potential consequences, which are going to look very different than they do with Russia. So it will be uh, not something I think we can easily predict, and it's something where we have to stay very close to the geopolitical and economic dynamics. We've only got a few minutes left. I, I wanted to ask one final question and then wanted to go around the, the virtual room and, and just see if there are any closing comments or thoughts. But my um, question is, does a slowing mainland Chinese economy make Hong Kong more or less important to Beijing? And within each of those, does, the, does that make Beijing more or less likely to pay attention to business sentiment and be responsive? Um, I could spin out scenarios in all directions on either way, partly because it's hard to know what Xi Jinping is thinking uh, uh, about this. But I want to just get your thoughts on how, under the assumption that China's economy is in a, in a secular uh, slowdown, not necessarily rapid, not necessarily precipitous, but just slowing down, how does that uh, affect the trajectory in, in Hong Kong? Charles, maybe I'll start with you. Well, it, uh, it's a great question. <laughs> that leaves a lot of uh, consideration. So uh, my quick answer is probably yes and no. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that uh, it, 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 in some ways, uh, uh, it might slow down some of the political motivations from China to change Hong Kong uh, because of the pressure that they are facing in all sectors. But on the other hand, uh, I think if there is such a uh, slowing down of the economy and the the lowering of the growth, it also puts pressure on the Chinese regime. So will they take it as a sign that they will have to uh, conduct more political exercise or more political type of uh, actions across the board to solidify the uh, party control? That might be also a consideration. So just like anything else in China, I think it's it's not a simple yes or no answer. It's probably yes and no, and probably moving in two directions or more directions simultaneously at the same time. Is that Schrodinger's cat or something? Um, um, anyone else have any prognostications on that? Um, it's a difficult answer uh, to give in a 30 second soundbite, <laughs> Jude, but um, when China's economy slows, Hong Kong's economy takes a hit as well. So that's one consideration. And yes, uh, the dollar and access to global capital markets are really important. So even with a slower Chinese economy, it does make Hong Kong important for that window of capital in and out that would remain. But the key word that Charles brought up when it comes to Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party is control. Control overall is always important and perhaps of paramount importance when things are sliding. So mm -hmm. I don't think there'll be less control and more opening up during difficult times, as we've seen during COVID, both for mainland China and for Hong Kong. Um, in just the last minute or two, any, any final thoughts or benedictions? Um, uh, and I think especially any thoughts on um, uh, what 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 choices we can still make that can be uh, positive for for Hong Kong? We're we're very much in a cul-de-sac of negativity here in D.C. As as Hanscom was laying out, you know, just the idea that Hong Kong is yet another mainland city. We've done what we can. The battle is lost. Um, any any thoughts on on how we can course correct that? I really worry about this notion of the battle is lost and Hong Kong is done emanating from Washington. Hong Kong uh, for the U.S. and for U.S. foreign policy remains an important place in setting an example for U.S. policy in other parts of Asia beyond China. And the U.S. should be reaching out to Hong Kong people and being involved in sharing those values and important aspects of U.S. Uh, 
belief and U.S. business and foreign policy. I don't think we should be putting human rights here and business over here as if there shouldn't be an interconnection. So thinking of Hong Kong is, as done is a worrying trend for Asia and foreign policy overall. Charles, any thoughts? Yes, I, I agree. Uh, and I also want to uh, 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 mention a news that I just read uh, yesterday about uh, probably one of the largest, if not the largest, multinationals uh, in the world, which is the Vatican, uh, talking about uh, uh, the uh, looming crackdown that they may be facing and moving uh, many of the data, which in their terms is actually documents, tons of them, document moving them out of Hong Kong and warning uh, their churches and organizations that there will be a lot of uh, possible crackdowns coming up. So I think the mentality for companies to take is that uh, they probably need to be much more vigilant than they were before and take some of the steps that's necessary to protect themselves and their staff and employees or communities and so on. But on the other hand, I also agree with uh, Tara that uh, we should not give up on Hong Kong. We should be talking about it uh, we should not shy away from even, talk, even talking to China whenever we have the chance or business community has the chance to talk about these issues. Don't just talk about the COVID policies. Talk to them about the national security laws if companies or corporations have concerns about them. So I think uh, if, if anything I, I, we could leave with this uh, webinar is that, uh, yeah, keep Hong Kong on the agenda uh, because uh, not only because it is important for business, I think it's important for the world uh, and important for China as well. Jessica, I'll give you the final word. Uh, thank you, Jude. I'll, I'll try to keep it short and, and kind of echo some of the comments that were previously made. Um, I think Hong Kong remains a, a very vibrant city, a city that people like to live in, uh, both uh, local and expatriate populations. Um, it is a city that has still retains some of the openness that it's had. It has deteriorated significantly. And I think some of what we can do as, as Americans and as the international community is to try to support whatever we can, um, the access to the, to the international markets, to international news, to international ideas, um, because that's part of what makes Hong Kong so vibrant and people there are still very hungry for it. And they are motivated people, right? Hong Kong is the can do, it's can, not cannot, right? And I think it maintains a lot of that spirit even though it's been a bit battered over the last couple of years. And I think it's important for us to continue to invest, you know, carefully, you know, acknowledge that you're in a different environment and that you've got to do some risk management contingency planning, but invest and, and support the local population to engage in an international world, not solely a Hong Kong or Chinese world. Well, I think those were um, uh, appropriate remarks to end uh, what was otherwise a fairly depressing event, uh, in thinking about the realities of that Hong Kong and the Hong Kong people are facing. But I think we came back to a, a good place of um, centering our focus here in the United States on the Hong Kong people. Um, doing everything we still can, um, which is, you know, Tara, to your point, significant, and also understanding the implications for U.S. foreign policy more widely for, for um, how we um, focus or not on, on Hong Kong and the implications there. Um, um, I, I want to thank everyone for joining today's event. I, I certainly want to and especially thank the Consulate General in, in Hong Kong and Macau for, um, for participating, and then, of course, to Charles, Tara, and Jessica. Um, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day, but I know it reflects how important you think this issue is. So I want to thank you for, for joining us and, and hope we can um, continue the conversation. So thanks to everyone and, and have a, an, an excellent Wednesday. Thanks, Jude. Thank you. Thank you, Jude.